Counting to God, Part 2. We've been dealing with uh, Douglas L.'s book, Counting to God, A Personal Journey Through Science to Belief. And uh, it is available on the internet if you uh, want it. And uh, I think it's a definitely worthwhile uh, work. I recommend it. In fact, when I'm quoting for it and you see those yellow ellipses, that means that if you really want to know, you're going to have to read the book. So I'm suggesting that you do so. Uh, this uh, is the cover of the book. And uh, we're going to be dealing with part one, studying the stage, but we've de dealt with the first three chapters last time. We're going to slow down a little bit and look a little deeper now. Uh, and uh, we're going to start with chapter four, which is entitled Religion versus Scientism. He asked the question, what is religion and what is science? And then he gives two quotes, one by Albert Einstein. The scientist's religious feeling takes the form of a rapturous amazement at the harmony of natural law, which reveals an intelligence of such superiority that in comparison with it, the highest intelligence of human beings, and there are those who would claim that Einstein was close to that, uh, is an utterly insignificant reflection. This feeling is the guiding principle of his life and work. And then Richard Feynman's statement, if it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. And that simple statement is the key to science. And I would wholeheartedly agree, science as it should be done is experiments first, fitting them together afterwards. Um, he starts out chapter four, people use the word religion in different ways. And if you wanted to get technical about it, it's not always clear when something becomes a religion. But for most people in the United States, and actually for more than half the people in the world, their religion is a tradition of faith that traces back 3,800 years to a man called Abraham. The note says some people didn't believe in Abraham, but uh, it's turning out that he's in all probability a real person. Abraham is considered the father of three major world religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. They're collectively referred to in this book as the faiths of Abraham. Uh, today there are perhaps 14 million Jews, 2.3 billion Christians, and 1.6 billion Muslims. The faiths of Abraham make claims about the universe that many other religions do not make. The faith of Abraham claimed that everything in our reality was created by, was designed by, and is subject to the control of an intelligent being in a different reality. It is a shocking claim. It only seems less so because civilization has had 3,800 years to get used to the idea. It began as an assertion of pure faith thousands of years before humanity would ever, would even consider the possibility of experimental verification. This intelligence, this being whom they claim designed, created, and controls our reality is the God of the face of Abraham, the God of the Bible. Um, a, a interesting sidelight, obviously he considers that people who try to split the Muslim God from the Christian God is not really fair. The real reality is we're arguing about the properties of God, not God, not the existence of that God. The Hebrew Bible contains fantastic stories of Abraham speaking with God and even of his grandson Jacob wrestling with God or an angel of God. I'm not clear exactly which. Uh, some would argue, indeed many today would strongly argue, that the biblical stories in the faiths of Abraham can no longer be taken seriously. To some, they are an unwelcome caveman relic of a primitive past, like finding a bearskin loincloth in a men's clothing store. A competing and powerful view of reality has risen. It claims to be based on modern science, but it is not. And that is the heart of this book. It is a new and competing, that is it, uh, the new the system, and competing system of belief to those of Abraham. One name given to this new belief system is scientism. Another is naturalism. Stated most simply, scientism, 
also known as naturalism, is the belief that everything can or eventually will be explained by science. The PBS series, Faith and Reason, puts it this way. In essence, scientism sees science as the absolute and only justifiable access to the truth. Scientism is a belief that only this reality and only the natural laws of this reality can be true. Scientism rejects any possible validity of religious or metaphysical inquiries. There can be no greater truth, no greater reality. Scientism Quote, is the view that the physical world is a self-contained system that works by blind, unbroken natural laws. End quote. By definition, scientism rejects the existence of God, or certainly of the Abrahamic God. Scientism is not science. Science is the observation, experimental investigation, and explanation of natural phenomena. Scientism puts a box around science and says you can't look outside the box for truth, even when you ask why the stuff in the box is there or how it came to be. According to scientism, the box is the box is the box. There is nothing else. There are no truths other than the truths of science. But that is a belief. When engaged in science, when observing the natural world and seeking explanation of phenomena, you do not have to believe that the natural laws you will observe will ultimately explain everything, including the riddle of existence. Of course, almost all the time, the vast body of knowledge we call science will perfectly and adequately explain what you observe. If one wishes to calculate rocket trajectories or predict chemical reactions, there is generally no need to suggest metaphysical explanations or processes. We realize no magic words or ceremony will turn base metals into gold. The box of modern science is large. It can be, predict weather, galaxy formation, crop yields, and mutation probabilities, among countless other items. Although, maybe not quite so good at weather. Um, but is there more to reality? Is science the only truth? A few questions, a few great questions, ask what is outside the box. The great questions are beyond science. Perhaps without fully realizing what is at stake, a large part of our popular Western culture has swallowed it, that is, scientism, whole. It has become the prevailing paradigm of existence, and it is bleak. It goes something like this. There is no other reality. There is no God. We are here solely because of random, purposeless events. Our universe was not designed. Our Earth is not special. Life has no purpose. Humanity owes its existence solely to the random, purposeless, accidental creation of a living organism billions of years ago and countless random mutations driven by natural selection. We are, quoting, just a chemical scum on a moderate-sized planet orbiting around a very average star in the outer suburb of one among 100 billion galaxies, end quote. There is not and has never been a greater purpose or a greater meaning to life. From this view, quote, the more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it seems pointless, end quote. That's the, and, and these, by the way, are famous uh, quotes. The last one, I believe, is from uh, Steven Weinberg. Uh, it has its own high priests and zealots who will use any means necessary to defend it. In most major universities, a teacher of the sciences who openly challenges this bleak philosophy is not likely to get tenure. A powerful modern media, newspapers, magazines, television, and movies continually reinforce this anti-faith faith worldview. This, scientism is a system of belief, but it is not a faith in the traditional sense. Science is the direct opposite of traditional faith. It is belief in anti-faith. As we begin this third millennium, there's amazing scientific evidence that our reality is not all there is, and that both our universe and life itself were designed. I see in this evidence a powerful cause for hope. Religious belief in a created universe has become acceptable, accepted scientific fact. As many have pointed out, the first words of the book of Genesis describe in general terms a sequence that led to human beings. We will not debate here how many days it took. And there's a note which I will share. The original Hebrew word is yom, and one of its meanings is an indefinite period of time. See chapter 16. So when we get to 16, we'll have a little bit more um, of a, 
of a, uh, a discussion of that particular issue um, of interest um, uh, for those of you who came early enough to see the you may have noticed the email that was up uh, suggesting that uh, Douglas L's uh, views are in uh, flux shall we say and uh, uh, perhaps he is not quite as strong as that sounds for the idea of uh, six-day creation. But um, science now tells us our universe was created and is fine-tuned for life. Science now tells us Earth is a special planet. Science now tells us es essentially to a mathematical certainty that life could not have arisen by chance and that the design of human beings could not have been a meaningless random event. I think science is telling us there is a greater reality. I think science suggests that everything in our universe originated as an idea in the mind of God. There's plenty of intellectual room for wonder, and that is wondrous news. If you choose to believe in some kind of a greater reality or some kind of purpose to the universe, you need not abandon science or logic. You can hold your head up high in debate. And science and logic will be your allies. You have been given freedom, intellectual and scientific freedom, to believe or not to believe. But for now, at least, you will not find this message of hope reported in the popular media. It will not make the evening news or tomorrow's New York Times. It is contrary to the prevailing worldview, and modern culture is not ready to accept it. Many people will be rigid in their view that religion is contrary to science and will not be open to the evidence, to scientific facts that strongly point in the opposite direction. To learn, you must begin with an open mind. This book will not ask you to use faith to overcome gaps in logic. It will not ask you to ignore scientific facts. It will ask you to take them seriously. A lot has been written on what is religion and what is science, most of which is little of little help here. It's interesting for a guy who's been reading science, religion, uh, books for a long time on airplanes when he has really nothing else to do. This book focuses on the beliefs of the faiths of Abraham to the extent they can be stated as facts subject to experiment, such as beliefs about creation, the universe, earth, and life. As for science, I like the way physicist Richard Feynman put it, if it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. And that simple statement is the key to science. As we will see, these fundamental Abrahamic beliefs agree with experiment and observation with true science. The experimental facts disagree with the belief system of scientism. And that those two statements are, I think, where he has, uh, uh, where he is particularly coming from. Uh, skipping on, the time has come to examine the common ground between science and religion with reason and not emotion. Science and religion are different ways to the truth and approach the great questions by different paths. We must move beyond not only the ignorant distrust of science, but also the modern condemnation by our popular media and certain groups of religious beliefs. Persons on each side despise the worldview of the other. Some religious traditionalists treat science as heresy. Some scientists mock religious beliefs. Many on both sides refuse to acknowledge that perhaps the perhaps shocking consensus that is beginning to emerge. Many theologians are not comfortable with efforts to detect scientific evidence of God in the universe. Many scientists mistakenly reject such evidence as unscientific because it threatens their system of belief, their scientism. It is unthinkable, perhaps horrifying, to many scientists and religious persons that the other discipline is headed in the same direction. Yet that is exactly what I see emerging. Like it or not, science and religion have become allies in the search for ultimate truth. They have become interconnected paths to understanding the universe. Science and religion are converging on wonder. There are new connections among the ancient concepts of number, universe, and God. Knowing these powerful and unexpected connections could make a difference in your life. Through the belief system of scientism, belief in anti-faith, 
uh, pardon me, though the belief in scientism, the belief in anti-faith has become the prevailing paradigm, the accepted worldview of our modern culture and is strongly advocated by a vocal minority of atheists, scientism is not accepted by most people. In the United States, a strong majority of Adventist uh, adults, excuse me, <laughs> that's bad, believe in God. In a uh, June 2011 Gallup poll, 92% of adults asked, answered yes when asked, do you believe in God? Belief was less, but always above 80% among young people and liberals. So what you're seeing is a um, tyranny of a minority, if you please. Despite this, many religious believers, particularly well-educated believers, are painfully aware that they are not in sync with the popular paradigm. They often feel intellectually oppressed by modern culture, uneasy about their beliefs, and have a misplaced perception about, uh, that these beliefs are contrary to science. In a sense, they feel persecuted. Some followers of the faiths of Abraham think they must reject modern science. As I will show, that is not true. Belief and science are now allies. That is, as long as you define science as the Richard Feynman kind of science, if it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. I wrote this book so you may have the intellectual freedom to believe. There truly is a strong scientific base for wonder, for awe, and astonishment, surprise, and the admiration, and admiration at the miracle of existence. This scientist scientific basis for wonder is increasing. Not so long ago, people thought our universe had always existed. Now we know our universe was created and that space and time are connected and flexible. Not so long ago, people thought our bodies were made up largely of some simple jelly-like substance. Now we know our bodies have trillions of specialized and interconnected cells, each of which is like a complex three-dimensional city with libraries, factories, trucks, and highways. More recently, we learned a mysterious force is pushing galaxies away from us, and we learned DNA contains multiple levels of information. Modern science continues to reveal the wonder of nature, of existence, excuse me. You have a choice. You can accept the dogma of scientism as fact and believe the universe is an accident without meaning or, and without purpose, and live your life that way, or you can use the gift of reason to consider new evidence, Evidence that just might lead you to believe in a designed universe of absolute wonder and evidence that just might let you live your life with meaning, with purpose, and with a sense of, great, of a greater reality, in awe of life's mysteries and design. Choose well. It's your life. And then chapter five, paradigm blindness. If it's true, why don't most people see it? A man hears what he wants to hear and disregards the rest. Paul Simon from The Boxer. You might think, or perhaps you would like to think, that scientists are always open to and always seeking out new ways of looking at and understanding our world. At the level of specific individual facts and narrow specialized areas and theories, this is generally true. But scientists are people, and like all people, they tend to approach problems and issues using the techniques and assumptions they have learned. They strive to fit scientific facts into the concepts of reality they have learned and adopted. They too suffer from confirmation bias, a tendency to favor information that confirms their internal beliefs and assumptions. Confirmation bias is like an intellectual, or in, like an internal yes man. In his 1962 book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, Thomas Kuhn described how difficult it is to challenge or change broad scientific concepts. His book was named by the New York Times in 1987 as one of the 100 most influential books since the Second World War. It has been cited in over 28,000 scientific and scholarly articles. Kuhn introduced the term paradigm shift. He observed that scientific development generally does not take place in a smooth, linear manner. Instead, scientists create worldviews or paradigms to solve problems. Um, actually, paradigm was deliberately chosen not to mean worldview, but that would take uh, us off on a tangent there. Um, paradigm is not complete when it starts out. 
A paradigm is a way of looking at the world and approaching problems. Within the paradigm, scientists develop ways for addressing and solving problems, and it becomes hard for them to pr approach problems any other way. Kuhn wrote, in a sense that I am unable to explicate further, the proponents of competing paradigms practice their trades in different worlds. This is true today. Some scientists work within a random pointless universe, while others work within a universe of design and wonder. A vast gulf separates the two views. The concept of paradigm shift helps to explain why so many intelligent people are culturally blinded to the religious implications of modern science. Philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer is said to have written, all truth passes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. Third, it is accepted as self-evident. Evidence of design in the universe is at the second stage. It faces violent, virulent opposition. Some of the greatest paradigm shifts in history have involved concepts of space and time. The examples below illustrate the concept of a worldview or paradigm and how difficult it is to challenge or change an existing paradigm, particularly for well-respected uh, scientists. These scientists have been schooled by, in the paradigm. They have secured tenure within it and have wrapped themselves in it both professionally and personally. Well, at least the modern ones have tenure. Back in Isaac Newton's day, tenure didn't exist, but that's uh, another story. They have a huge investment in the existing paradigm. To a large extent, they have defined themselves by it and they cannot see beyond it. Um, he begins with Aristotle. Aristotle in 384 BC uh, to 322 is a giant in the history of civilization. According to the Encyclopedia Britannica, Aristotle more than any other thinker determined the orientation and the content of Western intellectual history. Aristotle explored the natural world logically through logic which he believed to be supreme above all. Aristotle believed in a God of sorts, but not a moral or compassionate God, and certainly not the God of the Bible. Aristotle believed the universe was infinite and eternal, limitless in size, and had always existed with the earth as its center. Other heavenly bodies, the sun, the moon, the stars, and the planets, were all thought to revolve around the earth, which is what it looks like. They were thought to be divine and capable of moving only in perfect circles. Elaborate models were created with Earth at the center and various crystal shells rotating around Earth. One of the shells was the fixed stars. Other shells accounted for the planets. One problem was that some heavenly bodies did not fit well within the shell model. The planets seemed to go back and forth relative to the stars in strange paths that had little, if any, relation to perfect circles with Earth at the center. For example, at certain times, the planet Mars traces a loop in the sky against the fixed background stars, as do Jupiter and Saturn. To accommodate such strange motions, this ancient model, known as the Ptolemaic system, was repeatedly made more complex with circles on top of circles. The resulting chaos was less than divine. Some believed that, quote, no system so cumbersome and inaccurate as the Ptolemaic could possibly be true of nature. Despite these problems, the Ptolemaic system continued as the reigning paradigm for more than 2,000 years. Copernicus. After the first 1,900 years, Nicolaus Copernicus, 1473 to 1543, challenged the classical Greek paradigm and the Ptolemaic system. Copernicus was educated in Italy but lived primarily in what is now Poland. He dabbled in many fields. He was a mathematician, a military leader, a diplomat, a governor, and even a canon in the Catholic Church. But he's almost always remembered for his work in astronomy and his challenge to Aristotle. Based on astronomical observations, Copernicus suggested the sun was the center of the cosmos and Earth and other planets revolved around the sun. It may be the most shocking revolutionary theory in the history of science. At once, it provided a radically new way to look at a variety of facts, the varying brightness of the planets, now explained in part by differences in distance from the Earth, the closeness of Venus and Mercury to the Sun, now explained by smaller orbits, the varying speeds of the planets, 
Copernicus was able to calculate the order of the planets from their relative speeds, and so on. After, I think, I just got a duplicate slide. Sorry about that. While elegant in many respects, the new Copernican model had its own serious problems. How could it be, if Earth revolved around the sun, that the stars remained fixed? Was it really possible that the stars were almost unthinkably far away and the Earth was adrift in immense space? Now, I will point out, we'll come back to that because that's actually not accurate. And if the motion of the stars was caused by Earth's rotating, why didn't everything immediately fly off from the surface of the Earth? There was no known principle of physics that could explain the stationary nature of objects on Earth. Copernicus's challenge was finally published in 1543 as he lay on his deathbed. Some believe the first published copy was given to him on the day he died. Copernicus shook the ancient paradigm, but it didn't break, at least not completely. More than 140 years passed before the world would generally accept the beauty and simplicity of Copernicus's model. The breakthrough came from a man of perhaps even greater genius, Isaac Newton. Newton made major contributions to physics, mathematics, and optics, and invented calculus as well. French mathematician Joseph Louis, uh, Joseph Louis Lagrange said, Newton was the greatest genius who ever lived and also the most quote, the most fortunate, for we cannot find more than once a system of the world to establish, end quote. Interestingly, because uh, Einstein came along and established another one anyway. Um, Newton wrote, if I have seen further, it is by standing on ye shoulders of giants. That's in a letter to Robert Hooke, for what it's worth. Two of those giants were Johannes Kepler and Galileo Galilei. Kepler described mathematical rules for the orbits of planets. Galileo demonstrated that gravity causes all objects to fall with the same acceleration, regardless of their mass, and with his improved telescope, discovered the four major moons of Jupiter. Newton developed three basic laws of motion. He added his most astonishing concept, a theory of universal gravitation, Newton proposed that every object is attracted to every other object instantly and throughout all space by the force of gravity. He further proposed that the gravitational force between two objects is proportional to the mass of each and the inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. If the distance is doubled, the gravitational force is reduced by a factor of four. With his breakthrough theory of universal gravitation, and his three laws of motion, Newton was able to show mathematically why the planets obeyed Kepler's laws. He also explained the motion of comets, the moon around the Earth, and the Earth around the Sun. His theories of gravitation and motion explained why objects remained stationary on Earth as Earth rotated on its axis each day and revolved around the Sun each year. Newton's principle of universal gravitation and his laws of motion finally tipped the balance in favor of the Copernican model. The paradigm shifted and Copernicus's model of Earth and other planets revolving around the sun, all in accordance with Newton's concept of universal gravitation and laws of motion, became the accepted worldview for the scientific community. Today, the Ptolemaic model of concentric crystalline spheres around Earth seems ridiculous. Uh, but it lasted for over 2,000 years through a large part of recorded human history, and it took hard work by many geniuses to break it. Major scientific paradigms are hard to change, especially if they're approximately correct for what we can experiment with. In this case, it took concepts of number, mathematical formulations for motion and gravitation to change our understanding of the universe. Newton broke the Aristotelian paradigm in a second way. Aristotle thought humanity should be able to figure out the universe through reason alone. Newton showed that experimental testing and observation and analysis of results were also needed. After Newton, the modern scientific method gained favor and the impact of science upon civilization accelerated slowly at first, but then dramatically. The basic tenets of the scientific method is simple. 
If experimental results don't support a theory, the theory must be modified. Yet even now, experimental, experimental facts are typically ignored if they conflict with the existing paradigm of a world created without reason or design. Newton did agree with Aristotle that the universe was infinite and eternal, that it was unlimited in size and it always existed. Newton also believed in the God of the Bible, an intelligence that created and designed our universe. Newton saw evidence of design everywhere. As he said, this most beautiful system could only proceed from the dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. Albert Einstein, a more recent example of a paradigm shift and one that is central to the ideas of this book is Albert Einstein's theory of relativity. For over 200 years, scientists generally thought Isaac Newton had fully explained how the heavens work. Newton's laws of motion and the theory of gravity fully explained the orbits of the moon and the planets, at least within the accuracy of Newton's time. And who could argue with or doubt Newton's concept of absolute space and time? Were they not self-evident? Certainly no established scientist dared challenge the Newtonian paradigm. But there were some contrary experimental results, some serious flaws in the Newtonian worldview. Scientists such as James Clerk Maxwell and Hendrik Lorenz developed a theory of electromagnetism that required a fundamentally different view of space and time. Perhaps the most troubling experiments involved the concept of relative motion. Everyone knew that the motion of a body relative to observer depends in part on whether the observer is also moving and in what direction, and we still believe that. Uh, all motion is relative to a fixed framework of absolute space and absolute time, according to the Newtonian view of the world. Any two moving objects were thought to pass through the same immovable grid, so to speak, and any measure of distance and time should be exactly the same according to both. The problem was, light didn't seem to work that way. Scientists imagined that visible light, other radiation, and gravity traveled through ether, which was thought to be everywhere. A number of very smart people created experiments to detect the ether. The most famous of these is the Mitchelson-Morley experiment of 1887. Albert Mitchelson and Edward Morley figured out a way to detect small variations in the speed of light. I'm omitting the details, but they couldn't find any. Whichever direction light traveled, whether it was going in the same direction as Earth, rotating around the sun, or against it, the speed of light was exactly the same. There was no evidence of the ether. From 1790 to 1890, at least four major experiments looking, looked for the evidence of the ether. All failed. This was contrary to the D Newtonian paradigm. No established scientist was able to explain it perhaps because it was not possible to find a solution within Newtonian paradigm, and scientists were not willing or not able to think outside the dominant Newtonian paradigm. The answer came from outside the scientific community of the day, from a Swiss civil servant whose official title was patent clerk third class. One problem the Swiss were trying to solve was how to synchronize clocks in different cities so the trains could run on time with closer schedules and ships could navigate more e efficiently. Various solutions were proposed and some of their patent applications were reviewed by a young man who had been able, unable to find an academic position. His name was Albert Einstein. Einstein's workload was light, at least for him, and he was free to spend a good portion of his days thinking about clocks and the concept of time. He made up a number of thought experiments to help understand the problem. In one of these, he imagined two towers. What does it mean, Einstein asked, to say that they are both struck by lightning at exactly the same instant? He realized that because the speed of light is finite, whether the lightning strikes were simultaneous in the eyes of an observer would depend on where the observer was located. Lightning strikes that were simultaneous to one observer closer to Tower 1 would, be, it would not appear simultaneous to another observer in a different location closer to Tower 2. And uh, so you, have the, you can actually have three of them. The center one sees them exactly the same time the one on the right sees the uh, lightning strike on the right before the left and the left vice versa. 
Einstein eventually came to the shocking conclusion that there is no such thing as absolute time. In effect, each observer carries his or her own clock. Each clock is separate, although there are rules for comparing one clock to another, and clocks that are not in relative motion will register the passage of time in the same way. With this freedom, so to speak, Einstein then asked what the rules of our universe would be if the experiments were correct. What if the speed of light really was the same as measured by all observers in different states of motion? This led to his theory of special relativity, which he published in 1905, his miracle year. Einstein claimed that absolute space and absolute time are illusions. His theory of special relativity was based on two startling but conceptually elegant key assumptions. One, the speed of light is always the same, whether the observer is at rest or moving in any direction at any speed. And two, the laws of physics are exactly the same, whether the observer is at rest or moving in any direction at any speed. That's it. In other words, you can't tell the difference by measuring the speed of light or performing any other experiment between stationary, being stationary or in constant unaccelerated motion. There is no fixed background grid of absolute space and time. In Einstein's theory of relativity, nothing can move faster than the speed of light. This didn't agree with Newton's theory that the force of gravity acted instantly through the, throughout the universe. Einstein worked hard to develop a theory that included gravity, and in 1915 he succeeded. He created his theory of general relativity by adding a third key assumption. The speed of light and all other laws of physics appear the same in a gravitational field as they do in uniform acceleration of the same strength. In this general theory of relativity, gravity is a result of space being curved by matter. These three key assumptions are postulates and the resulting equations are very elegant in a mathematical sense. It is as if there is a grander scheme at work, hidden symmetries and equivalences between space, time, and the laws of the universe. Einstein uses mathematics, in this case powerful and now proven connections between space and time to change the Newtonian paradigm. The story of Albert Einstein is a wonderful example of paradigm shift of the and of the difficulty in changing how the scientific community views reality. Einstein came from outside the system. He was not a tenured faculty member, and he did not have a personal investment in the ex existing paradigm. This is kind of an important point if you're thinking about changing paradigms. His ideas were not accepted overnight. His theories were not commonly accepted until 1919, after Arthur Eddington was able during a solar eclipse to measure the curvature of light by the sun. Even with this evidence, some scientists refused to abandon the prior par paradigm. As late as 1950, scientists were, discussing, or were conducting futile experiments to discover the imagined ether. Recent experiments have confirmed to within one part in 100 million billion that the speed of light does not change when an observer is in motion. Tests of general relativity continue. General relativity was able to explain a slight anomaly in the orbit of the planet Mercury, an anomaly that could not be explained by Newton's laws of motion. An amazing confirmation of general relativity was completed in 2011. Gravity Probe B contained four almost perfectly spherical gyroscopes spinning in liquid nitrogen in a satellite 400 miles above the Earth. This experiment took over 50 years from initial proposal to completion cost a reported $750 million, and required the development of 19 new technologies. The gyroscopes confirmed that space is twisted by Earth's rotating gravitational field. Because of the rotation of Earth, the axis of the gyroscopes was altered very slightly over time by 37 one-hundred thousandths, pardon me, 37 one-thousandths of a second of arc, the equivalent of a human hair 10 miles away each year. That kind of experiment may seem far-fetched, but Einstein's theories have practical uses. You probably have a GPS system in your car or phone. That technology uses special and general relativity. It compensates for the relative movement of the satellites and the slowing of time closer to Earth 
where Earth's gravitation field is stronger. Albert Einstein created a new paradigm of reality. His concepts of relativity were shocking. They destroyed the Aristotle-Newtonian paradigm of absolute space and time, a paradigm the world had accepted for thousands of years. Despite the obvious elegance and beauty of his ideas and the repeated experimental confirmation of the fixed speed of light, Einstein's concept of reality took many years to be accepted. Although he was ultimately hailed as, hailed as a symbol of scientific genius and a model for the scientific community and became by far the best known scientist of his time, Albert Einstein began as an outsider. And that ability to think outside of the prevailing scientific paradigm helped establish his greatness. Up to Einstein, scientific thought began with concepts of absolute space and time. No member of the established scientific community was able to break free from, of that paradigm. And now he comes to the kind of the punchline of this chapter, the bias against design. Today, vocal parts of the scientific community vigorously reject any notion of design in the universe and any suggestion of a greater reality. Some attack even the most innocent suggestions of design. For examples, see Ben Stein's excellent documentary, Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed. I met one of the victims years ago and offered legal help to fight his mistreatment by the Smithsonian Institution. This strong bias, this discrimination, this violation of intellectual freedom left me feeling a little angry and a little ashamed of the scientific community. What was wrong with discussing the mere possibility of design? Why wouldn't other scientists come to the defense? And it's interesting the way he phrases that, the defense instead of his defense. You can, you can tell his, uh, his uh, legal background. Scientific paradigms, accepted ways of understanding the world are hard to change. Max Planck, a great scientist and a discoverer of quantum physics, offered these words in his autobiography. A new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up that is familiar with it. Some say science progresses one funeral at a time. I think we've seen that quote used before. You have a choice. You can impartially consider new scientific evidence as it becomes available and revise your opinions as dictated by facts. Or you can do what most people do, just go with the existing paradigm. I'm asking you to have the courage to explore the harder path. I'm asking you to consider the evidence, some of the most sophisticated results of modern science, and make your own decision. Now, I... I find it's a fascinating book. I love it. Uh, it deals with questions that I find interesting and in ways that I find interesting. Um, uh, Douglas L. contrasts the Abrahamic faith with scientism. And he argues that scientism is incompatible with experimental results and that Abrahamic faith is compatible with those results. Uh, uh, interestingly, he sees uh, some religious opposition to this kind of uh, concordism, if I can call it that. It is unthinkable, perhaps horrifying to many scientists and religious persons that the other discipline is headed in the same direction. I, I think most Adventists are really quite comfortable with that. Um, L then asked the question, if it is true, why don't people see it? By people, I assume he means the cultural elites because other people do see it, in fact. Um, his explanation is paradigms. And I think that there is some truth to that. It's a partial explanation. But I think there's also religious bias and I would propose demonic exception. Of course, you don't want to say that while you're trying to influence cultural elites. Um, I, I think there are two minor weaknesses that I found in the chapters we reviewed. One of them is that the concept that we now know, science is now proving 
uh, uh, if you're not careful, can be a turnoff to some millennials. Uh, and uh, 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 we have to be careful with that. But that's, I do think it's still worthwhile saying this is where science is pointing at this time. And the other one I pointed out, uh, Ptolemy, in fact, thought the stars were unthinkably far away. That from the size of Earth, they were considered to be, uh, the Earth was considered to be a mathematical point compared with the sphere of the stars. So people have always known the stars were a long, long ways away. Uh, I don't think that was the major problem. It was perhaps a minor one. Um, but I will have to say, overall, I like the approach of the book. And I especially like the attention to the philosophy of science. Because as I see it, the key question that has to be at least tacitly, maybe not assented to, but entertained is that the current scientific consensus is not really science. But I, I, I like Douglas Hill's approach. His approach is similar to my approach in scientific theology and also in Science Discovers God by Ariel Roth. As we shall see, he's not a short age creationist. I wrote that before I got the email, so I think that he may be moving in that direction. But he does believe in a God who created the universe and can intervene in nature. And that is a huge step forward for somebody who formerly believed in scientism. I think if one follows him, half the battle is in fact over. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Ariel. Uh, I uh, fully approve of your approval of Doug's book. It, uh, it really uh, touches at the problems that we don't discuss often enough. And uh, there are many things I could say, uh, but I think what might be added to the thing, it's not an addition, it's just amplification. It is, I think, difficult for us to appreciate how insidious uh, paradigms are. Uh, it's, uh, when a paradigm first becomes established after a conflict and so on, there's a lot of discussion about whether it's true or false and so on. And, and, uh, but what happens after that is that sociology takes over. And by this I mean that uh, we tend to accept the paradigm and as when we accept it, uh, this influences others to think, well, uh, this is true. And so uh, everybody thinks it's true. And once that is established, it's very hard to change. And uh, as Kuhn pointed out, it takes a, a, a scientific revolution to, to do it. Uh, and when a paradigm is dominant, uh, it's not questioned generally. It's not ridiculed. Or, if it, or in the opposite paradigm is ridiculed. And uh, insidiously, we accept this as truth. Uh, I would point, point out that uh, uh, humanity's uh, intellectual history changes. And this tells us that uh, paradigms are to be sus suspect. Uh, when Aristotle uh, proposed his ideas, they were unquestionably accepted during scholasticism and what uh, in some respects called the Dark Ages. Uh, uh, many historians object to that term. Uh, 
uh, the church followed Aristotle. And then later on when Newton came around, the church accepted Newton uh, and a mechanistic worldview is adopted. And then of course we have uh, relativism and uh, quantum mechanics and so on coming in and changing the picture lately. Uh, and mechanism or mechanistic philosophy has dominated now more or less in, in society, but uh, uh, Doug pointed out very much how you know this this uh, continues the the uh, the idea of uh, of uh, the old paradigms and so on that you can continue and. So uh, we're faced with uh, the difficulty of how much of a of what we read and so on is a paradigm that no one questions. We cannot repeat all the experiments of the past. Right. And how much of this uh, uh, should we question? And I, I tend to fall back on uh, what I think uh, Doug is going to fall back in the rest of the book here, and that is uh, there are solid scientific facts that uh, seem to be more reliable, and you, you look for those solid scientific facts uh, to lead you to uh, truth. And those facts, I, I haven't read the, book, the rest of the book, uh, those facts tell you that, hey, there's got to be a designer here. And once there is a designer, this changes the whole horizon. Yeah. And uh, the Bible becomes a possibility as a reality. And you have a whole new area that you can allow for, for uh, uh, explaining so many of the questions that we can't explain otherwise, like our consciousness, our conscience, and uh, our freedom of choice, and all, so many other things uh, that are difficult to explain within a simplistic, scientific, materialistic outlook. So uh, I think part of our problem is to establish what are the facts that we, or the interpretations, and it's hard to tell facts or interpretations at times when the paradigms dominate. Uh, where is the most reliable information? But I think science points to a designer. A designer would point to some communication to us, and that communication would be the Bible. Yes, Wesley. I have some remarks that I would like to make, but I'm really kind of hesitant to, <clears throat> knowing what I'm going to say, roughly, because the overwhelming uh, feeling that I have, and I think we should have, in listening to you in this presentation, is excitement that it has been presented so clearly. And as Ariel has just emphasized, reiterated, that uh, the paradigms that have held, uh, we really need to challenge, and that they are being challenged is so exciting. But uh, with your permission, may I say that the first entity that is being, and I might add creature, to challenge a paradigm was Satan. And he did so very effectively, and to our eternal and vast grief, in the first institution of higher learning, the Garden of Eden, and used the same logic 
did he tell you that? And proceeded to challenge and to our distress rather effectively the prevailing paradigm. And then proceeded to fix it in place. And now, anyone who challenges his paradigm is the paradigm freak. Having said that, I'll. <laughs> well, it's it's an interesting else. it's an interesting point. I think. Um, I think that one of the things that uh, that we fail to realize is that when one challenges a paradigm, one has a positive obligation to show that one's challenge is itself not challengeable, or at least that if the challenge is um, makes more sense than the prevailing one. You know, I I think it's fair in science to challenge paradigms. It has led to, among other things, all kinds of things that we use right now. Uh, lasers that, uh, you know, we use laser pointers. Uh, GPS, uh, uh, the very fact that we have, I have a computer in my watch right now that is more powerful than the one I trained on for Fortran, you know, that took probably half this wall and then bent it over again and had a, another long tray like that at 16K of memory, you know. And that was the newest, most advanced one, uh, at least the, the most advanced the, the, uh, the uh, college could afford. But... Um, and it required an art priesthood of technicians changing the vacuum tubes. Uh, well, uh, ours was past the vacuum tubes. They were actually using transistors by then. But... Uh, uh, but it, it, it did have memory with crossed, uh, uh, crossed wires that had ferrite uh, deposited around them. So, a few years ago. But it was a few years ago, yes. <coughs> anyway, um, and that was an advance over people sitting in rooms writing numbers out and adding and subtracting them. That's where the term computer came from, was a person who actually did computing. And they had some people that were pretty good at, uh, you know, hand, hand calculating stuff. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, the, the machines we have now are just unbelievably good. Uh, not that they can't be better, uh, and in fact we expect them to be, and we expect their programs to be better, and uh, uh, as, as time goes on, it w will advance. The, the point of it is that, that I have a hard time saying that science isn't on to something. But I think that one of the things that he's pointing out is that the current scientific consensus is not the same as science done in, in terms of the way it ought to be done. And the way it sells itself as being done, and the way uh, that it tries to command our attention as being done. And I think that's really important. If you can make a distinction between those two, then I think he's going to argue, and in a way that I've seen argued before, that I've argued myself, that Ariel Roth has argued, uh, points to, strongly to, a designer of incredible, I mean, you can't say infinite from finite observations, 
but certainly consistent with an infinitely powerful designer and certainly in enough orders of magnitude higher than us that uh, as Einstein said we pale <coughs> in insignificance in terms of our intellect uh, and uh, and of course once you ask those questions and then you ask can this designer intervene in nature and the, and the answer at least for the origin of life is yes we don't know how uh, but if you can do that, then, then basically kind of all bets are off and we're going to have to go, revisit all the questions that scientism thought it had closed. And I think that that's the really important message that's going to come out of this book, ha having read it all the way through so yeah. far. Uh, just a, as an example of what, how science can go wrong, I'm going to mention the general theory of evolution. I'm not speaking of mic microevolution, I'm speaking of macroevolution. Or more is precisely, megaevolution. Megaevolution. Uh, there is virtually no data to support that idea. And yet, it is, it is a very dominant idea. And uh, when I first went uh, to the University of Michigan as a, as a graduate student there. Uh, that was also a few years ago. Several years ago. <laughs> we, we won't comment further. <laughs> uh, one of the things that str struck me was that practically every lecture I went to, there was a message in there about evolution. Whether it had to do anything with the lecture or not, it was there. And that made me think, hey, there's, a, there's an agenda here. There's an agenda here. But, uh, I mean, you look at the fossil record, you don't have the intermediates for evolution. You try and find a mechanism for complexity, you don't have it. Uh, you try to originate life by itself, you can't do that. But the thing prevails, the paradigm prevails and a lot of people believe it because everybody else does. Mm -hmm. And sociolo sociology takes over. Yeah, all intelligent people believe this. Well, you're an intelligent person, aren't you? Well, don't you believe it too? <laughs> so, uh, these paradigms are, they're insidious in, in their dominance and we need to more be, be more suspicious of that and look more at the hard data. Uh, I'll add my two cents worth <laughs> for what it's worth. Um, last week I mentioned that our brains have been wired for not only intelligence but for higher levels of thought. And the higher levels of thought include a spiritual inclination, a perception that we can perceive a reality out there which we call God. If we, if we didn't have that ability to even conceive of that reality, then there's something very much missing in our brains. So um, more and more brain research uh, is coming up with the idea that the brain is much more complicated than we ever realized. And I'm talking about the human brain. Um, we were talking about whether animals can count last week. Uh, maybe they can in a limited sense, but we're talking about the, li uh, the higher levels of thought that no animal can reach, no non-human animal can reach. And so, um, having said that, let's move in the direction of logic, which is my interest. Theology deals with philosophy and philosophy includes logic. So naturally, when you're becoming a theologian, a trained theologian, you're going to have to face the issues of logic. Now, you go a step further. <laughs> logic, as it's taught, can lead to proofs, especially in mathematics. And people who deal with math and some levels of philosophy love proofs. Now, 
the problem is uh, theologians kind of shy away from proofs. That's kind of a, a naughty word uh, because once you say something is proven, it doesn't allow for dissent, right? Proof text. Yeah, and then we have the term proof text. That might be a misnomer. You know, it, it's claiming too much of what we can use scripture for. So when you look at that level of reasoning that's in our brains, we're wired to think that way. The big question then is, are we moving in the direction of proof with Douglas L's book? And I'm just posing that. We may maybe or maybe not be moving in that direction, but it's something we need to think about. Well, th then the, the other question is, let's supposing we are moving in the direction of proof, is that bad? That's a good question. Very good. So there's, there's, several, there's several aspects of it uh, that I think are, are worth paying attention to. Um, I think we had a comment over here. Well, I think that depends if, if you're trying to decide is it inductive proof or deductive proof. Kinds of yeah, proofs. yeah. Yes. There's different kinds. And, of and inductive there. proofs have been recognized as not really totally, in, yeah. at least in the mathematical sense, proof. Yeah. But Although right. they are strong enough that we live our lives that way. Uh, it, it, gravity is not provable, but it's reliable enough that nobody really worries about it. If you throw a piece of paper towards the trash can, it will go down and not up towards the ceiling. And you can be pretty reliably certain of that. No, and, 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 unless there's a fan blowing. You know, unless there's a fan blowing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but you know, there's, there's, there's also this, this discussion on, you know, whoops, that sounds good. This discussion on um, uh, trying to understand science and what it really means you know it, we, we've talked about how to deal with that uh, in order to incorporate a discussion about uh, design and uh, one way has been done is to try to redefine what science is and it, it, you can do that two ways you can actually try to redefine a defense the position of or the, the definition of science or you can you can accept science as it is as something as explanations based on natural processes um, uh, but you can uh, but but then uh, you you have to start accepting that the concepts of metaphysics have sources of truth in them and uh, so there's there's really two ways to, to kind of approach that one way is to say science doesn't have everything yeah it's just not it, it's just a box it's, it's just a small box and the there's stuff outside the, the box yeah the metaphysics is a big, bigger circle outside that box yeah and I, I think you can go either way and it has to be a good discussion to have is yeah. what's the best way to approach it um, well I think that I think that the one point is that there are people who will insist that the box is all you've got. Yeah. Well, that's what and, scientism is. And that's what scientism yeah. is. And to identify those two definitions yeah. is uh, he's going to argue from data that it's premature. And I think he's going to be right about it. Well, you know, uh, Einstein's initial work, that was more metaphysics because he never sat in a laboratory and, 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 and proved his ideas. They were all based on logic and mathematics. Uh, which uh, can apply both in science and in metaphysics. I mean, you, you, if you're going to do true, uh, find truth within philosophy, and which is considered a metaphysical right. concept, um, you you do that by using logic and and and, and mathematics or uh, applications of mathematics in there. Um, so it, it's it's one of recognizing that that those, you know. They're the uh, logic and math are the bones of science. Uh, they're they're a priori knowledge that exists yeah. both in science and metaphysics, mm -hmm. and uh, you can use those like like uh, um, also the, the the idea of a multiverse. I mean, that's something that is in the realm of metaphysics now. The goal is to find some way to to test it. Then you can move it into science, mm -hmm. and so 
uh, I, you know, I, I kind of like that Although approach a There are better. people now who are arguing that the, the multiverse really is science. Well, because, because and, they're proposing and, ways and, to detect it. And That's see, what they're this doing. is the problem. You have several definitions of science, and these people are insisting they all belong to the same... Well, there's people that believe you can detect the, uh, you can actually test for a multiverse, and then they, to them it becomes scientific. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, uh, but but in reality, uh, I don't think we're there yet in that because, um, uh, but there are being tests proposed. You know, there may be particles that can move through multiple dimensions that we can detect that would indicate the presence of a multiverse. Those those kind of ideas have been put out there. So in that sense, it becomes scientific. Uh, by the basic definition, or the accepted definition. But it starts out in a metaphysical realm, mm -hmm. based upon logic and mathematics. Um, and then but see, then again, is, uh, you're dealing with the definition, is science what could be testable, or is science what can be testable, has been tested, and has stood up to the test so far? There's well, a difference between those two. Yeah, one has to come to grips of where, where that borderline is at. Right. You know. See, I mean, it's, but you, for you example... To, you have to understand if... Is it a test that can really be done? Yeah. You know? <laughs> is alchemy science? Yeah, that's right. Well, at one time it was felt to be science. Uh, although in a kind of strange way it was not science as well. And, and this is where we have to be careful about how we define science and realizing that every time we define science it means that there will be questions where something will or will not fall within science. Um, that by other definitions would have had the opposite result. Yeah. And, um, and that's the whole thing, yes. Yeah. And then... Uh, Can I jump in? All right. And then we want to hear Dr. O. Um, well, yeah, Steve is... Uh, I'm next. Okay. <laughs> Steve is moving move. in a direction that I wanted to move, and I appreciate those comments, Steve. Um, we, we, we need a certain clarity, and fuzzy thinking never gets us anywhere, and we need to look at categories of thought, and metaphysics is a valid category. Logic is a valid approach. If it was invalid, then let's... Let's do away with the theory of relativity. <laughs> Let's do away with Einstein. And then we have no clue of where to go to find yeah. a laser's uh, GPS, yeah. uh, Bose-Einstein condensates, a whole bunch of things that are indisputably there in terms of you can do the experiment, you can get certain results, and you can show results to other people, and they can try it on their lab, and it will work, too. And that borders on the question of testability, too, and going to the lab and discovering things. Um, okay, logic, then, is valid, and that's what I wanted to hear. Um, we, we shouldn't <laughs> run away from it. <laughs> mm -hmm. We should use it as a val valuable tool uh, in research in probably all fields, including theology. If we have a set of doctrines that um, are a Christian faith that's illogical versus a Christian faith that's logical, presented logically, the logically presented faith is going to win more converts. Now, that's not the ultimate goal, but anything that leads us closer to God is important, and I think that's what Douglas L. is saying. We can use logic, we can use math, and we can use uh, the sciences, and we are, we're brought closer to the creator of the whole universe, the designer. Uh, we've had, last week we talked about the fundamentalist movement and how that it uh, was an attack on science. And I'm glad we're moving back into a middle of the road approach now. Uh, the evangelical movement is uh, recognizing the value of science, and that's, that's what we want. Um, unfortunately, the founder of Adventist Geology, George McCready Price, was on the attack of science, and 
the worst science of all was geology. So he wrote a book called Illogical Geology. I have to differ with him on that. I have to suggest that there is a certain logic. There is a certain logic the way the package is put together of Earth history, even long ages. There's a certain logic. Uh, it's not totally inconsistent. And what, as creationists, we want to do is try and also stack the, the evidence on the other side that there is a logic, corresponding logic, on the side of creationism involving miracle versus something that doesn't involve miracle. So um, let's not throw out logic is my message today. Well, I think it's probably fair to Price to say that his view was that standard geology was illogical rather than that his view of geology was illogical. I, it would be interesting to see, but I think that the title can't be used in quite that way. Uh, that, that he saw, here were all these evidence that these people who had their theory were ignoring. And that's illogical. Uh, uh, now, whether he had all the stuff nailed down, whether he had some facts that um, yeah. weren't completely accurate. That was the problem. That's a different. Facts, yeah. That's a different problem. Right. But I think that I think that to, to try to say uh, that that he was committing a logical error is 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 probably stretching it. I. I be interested in reading the reading the book again and seeing whether uh, seeing whether he was actually being logical with the stuff that he knew. Okay. I would like to go back to that word paradigm because that is one word that really frustrates me. Well, the I, um, <laughs> right now you know the political stuff that's going around and around and around. Uh, especially about uh, the public sector versus the private sector. I can, I can talk about that to people. Some people believe that the people in the, pri the public sector are the good guys, uh, the, or the, uh, the other way around, the people in the private sector is, is the bad guys, and they, the ones in the public sector are the good guys. Right. And um, I point out that no matter what side you're on, the people on both sides are all human. Mm -hmm. They're, they've got the same problems. They've got the same... They might be selfish. They might be greedy. It can happen... On the public side, it can happen on the private side. Now, when we get to the paradigm part, well, the paradigm is in that also. But when it comes to religion and science, that paradigm problem happens on both sides. And, it, and I am, that's what really frustrates me, because people aren't careful to understand that. For some reason, they think that, okay, I'm a religious person. You know, I've got the help of the Holy Spirit. You know, so I'm a little bit better on, I'm a little more confident on my side. But then, you know, I go over and visit, go to Utah, and I visit the people, our, our um, uh, Church of Latter-day Saints friends, and I think they've got some crazy ideas that they are confident that the Holy Spirit is helping them on. They've got paradigms. We've got paradigms. Secular people have paradigms. We all need to deal with it somehow. And um, to point to one person and say, well, your group's the one with the wrong paradigm, the bad paradigm, it's a little bit like Jesus says, you know, why are you concerned about the speck in the eye of that person when you haven't seen the log in your eye type of thing? So I think when it comes to paradigms, we really need to 
do some self-evaluations too to see what kind of paradigms we have and where we're stuck on. Uh, there's a, I was looking at, we got a book that says, you know, the old Bible story books, they were written, when were they written? In the 1950s, early 50s. 1950s, and we're still reading those to our kids. It's almost like, in a way, that's kind of an illustration of a paradigm. I'm not saying it's wrong or right, but, but it's almost like a paradigm that keeps going type of thing. And um, I'm just saying that we really need to do some self-evaluation, even with us who believe in God, on that respect. Well, I'm, I'm actually going to agree with you partly, and that is that, uh, that it's going to be important for us, I think, to convey some of those things to our kids. Because Douglas Hill is a kid, read about the waters came up and covered the highest mountains, even Mount Everest, probably somebody said. Um, uh, and of course, that's not good flood geology. Um, but it's a visual that will stick in a kid's head, and the kid will go, well, where'd it go afterwards? And it's a perfectly logical thing to ask. Mm -hmm. And so if you teach something that is too simplistic, you're actually setting yourself up for failure. Uh, or at least you're setting your kids up for failure. Um, you're setting people whom you wish to influence up for failure. And I think we have to be careful of that kind of thing. Um, And, and I, I agree with the, uh, with the problem with paradigms, be, one of the problems with paradigms being that uh, mm -hmm. it applies to everybody else, but it really doesn't apply to me. Um, and that's too easy to have happen to you. Uh, yeah, along the same line, I have. I agree, you know, that uh, people go off on these tangents. And uh, it bothers me when uh, they think they have uh, truth that you can't validate uh, simply because I like, I like to have some background for what I decide what is true. Um, on the other hand, uh, you push that too far, you're going to run into agnosticism and relativism and so on. And you'll have no truth. And we're looking for truth. And we want the paradigm of truth, of course. But uh, uh, as a, uh, an example of what uh, can happen here in terms of paradigms, uh, the paradigm at the time of Newton and Pascal, Lene, and Kepler, and uh, all those folks was, the Bible is true. God created in six days. There was a flood. And uh, this was part of the scientific era, uh, ethos. And he, uh, Doug even mentioned a, uh, an example, which is often quoted from uh, Principia, that, you know, uh, God had to be involved in this type of thing. And this is all through the literature. These folks all, and they could do their science with that simply because they, they were just studying the science that God had created. God had created these mm -hmm. laws and so on, and God was not excluded. But where I think... Uh, Science is in a particularly difficult situation right now. Is that considering that richer background of uh, these pioneers of modern science, science has now excluded the possibility of God. Folks, you don't find truth by excluding possibilities. This is no way to go. And I'm not going with this paradigm. 
whether you like the time paradigm or not, again, that's uh, debatable. Uh, but there are good paradigms and bad paradigms. And when you have a paradigm that's restricted in its viewpoint, and I'm looking for a broad concept of truth, I'm not going to go follow that one. I'm going to look for a paradigm that includes other possibilities. The more possibilities you have, the greater the chance of you finding truth. Well, with that, I will leave it. Um, come back next week, and we'll discuss the next chapter or two. Uh, and uh, I hope that uh, you find this book as interesting as I do.